Good evening. One more time. Good evening. Welcome to the League of Women Voters Forum relative to the Batavia Public School District 101 referendum. My name is Patty Lagman, and I am Voter Service Chair for the League of Women Voters of Central King County. I vote and have skin in this election, so I will not be moderating tonight. This forum is not like our usual candidate forums in that none of tonight's presenters are running for office. We will call them presenters instead of candidates. We have Tony Inglese and Lisa Hutchins from the Batavia School District who will be providing specific information on the referendum, why the district and the school board feel it is needed, and how it will affect each of the schools. We also have a representative from the Batavia, Batavians for Responsible Government, Sylvia Keppel, who will represent those against the passing of the rep referendum, and Juliana Concello, representing Vote Yes for Batavia Schools, representing those in favor of passing the referendum. Each of the three sections will have a 10-minute period to present their position on the referendum. We will then draw straws to see which of the two groups, pro and con, will go first in their presentation. The pre presentations will be followed by questions gathered in advance from the audience, gathered in advance and from the audience. You see the people walking around with the little um, french fry containers. Um, they have cards and pencils. Feel free to raise your hand and they will come and um, give you a card and a pencil. Someone asked why we do not have the questions asked by the audience. One. This is a forum, it is not a town hall. Two, this is the way the League of Women Voters does business. Three, I never give the audience a microphone. <laughs> and that's just so everyone has an opportunity to hear the questions and um, hear the answers of the questions and see if, if there's anything that um, catches your eye. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization, we are 103 years old, that neither supports nor opposes candidates or political parties for office. We do have an advocacy arm and we have many issues that we um, advocate for with our local legislature, legislators and our Congress people. The League's purpose is to promote political responsibility through the informed and active participation of citizens in government like yourselves. Obviously, you are participating because you're here tonight. Providing this forum allows citizens to become better informed about the issues facing their community and to become better acquainted with the candidates running for office and or the issues that are being voted on. We're happy to provide this service for the community. Today's forum is being live streamed and filled by Andrew Van Meter and Audrey Carp from our local Batavia Access television station, BATV. We could never say enough good things about BATV. They go on the road with us, and we are the only community that has a Batavia Access television station. So we really appreciate them. The tape will be posted on the websites of the League of Women Voters of Central Kane County, BATV, and the Illinois Voter Guide. Please note, the League of Women Voters is not responsible for verifying the accuracy of the statements made by any of the presenters in tonight's forum. At this time, I would like to introduce our moderator, Shannon Silverman, who is from the League of Women Voters of Arlington Heights, Mount Prospect, and Buffalo Grove. Shannon? Thank you, Patty. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. I'm very happy to be here. I think this is a wonderful opportunity for you all. Um, listening at home, as well as present here, and representative presents, presenters that you have in front of you. Um, my name is Shannon Silverman, as Patty mentioned, and I am a trained moderator for the League of Women Voters of Illinois. I have been a member of the League of Women Voters of Arlington Heights, Mount Prospect, and Buffalo Grove in various leadership roles for about a dozen years. I am a resident of Arlington Heights. As such, I am not a voter in this district. I do not have skin in this game. And I do not have any other interest in the referendum being requested here. 
The participants did agree to a two-segment formula, ground rules and media non-use prior to today. Those ground rules, out of fairness to each other and the audience, include that, I'm going to hit the highlights here, there are others, literature and other referendum campaign materials are not allowed to be handed out at this forum. Presenters will restrict their responses to the questions asked by me as moderator. There will not be exchanges between the presenters, as this is not a debate. Statements and responses will be timed and limited to the time allotted. 10 minutes for each opening statement and one minute for each answer to a question I ask. Since this is not a strict candidate forum format, we want to allow some depth to the answers to your questions. Once, if, it, if a question is directed to the school district presenters here today, each of the for and against presenters will have a one minute opportunity to add their response to the same question following the response made by the school district representatives. No attacks on a, oh, excuse me, unused time will not be carried over. No attacks on a presenter will be tolerated. And if it occurs, the moderator, me, may interrupt. You don't want me flexing my muscles. And the statement will not be aired on any websites or social media. The recording of this forum is owned by the League of Women Voters of Central Kane County. The copyright is theirs. And no presenter, nor their designee, may use any portion of this forum in advertisements or other material. There are a lot of reasons for this. I have been involved in something that went sideways. You don't want to do that. And the League expects everyone to honor this. Any use of the forum recording must have the prior express written permission of the League of Women Voters of Central Kane County. Audience, I ask that you refrain from applauding or in other ways demonstrating support or opposition of either side of the referendum question. This helps us save time, and it also creates a neutral, safe public space, which we all can appreciate. No campaign paraphernalia may be worn. This is a neutral public forum. I'll repeat that. Remember that everyone is here to learn more about the referendum as proposed. No cards and pencils have been provided on which to submit your questions. Questions will be screened by League volunteers for duplication, clarity and appropriateness to our ground rules. Please signal a volunteer if you need any assistance with adding input into the referendum uh, forum by submitting a question. Earlier this evening, the presenters and I did uh, draw lots as to the speaking order. The first part of the segment is going to be the opening remarks presentation. The school district representatives Tony and Glazy, with some uh, with his partner over there, Lisa Hitchens, will be presenting the first 10-minute presentation of the first segment of the forum tonight. According to the last the last that were drawn with me earlier tonight, the second presenter will be Juliana Cancelo, who is the representative for the referendum in support of it, and the representative of Vote Yes for Batavia Schools. Following Juliana, with her 10-minute opening presentation, will be Sylvia Capel. She is representing the against position and is a representative of the Batavians for Responsible Government. And with that, I'm not sure I didn't miss anything here. Presenters, please also notice the timers. You will be given, hopefully, plenty of opportunity to gather your thoughts as you approach your end of your time allotment. Obviously, please, I want you to finish your thought that you've started. But when you see the staff sign, please just wrap that sentence up if you can and allow um, the questions to move forward. We will now begin the forum with Tony and Glazy, who is acting as the representative, again, of the Batavia Public Schools, who will share specific information about the nature of the referendum request. Tony? Um, you can if you like. 
Thank you. We lost it. Damn. It's a fragile connection. All right, we should be good. All right, so thank you. My name is Tony Inglesi, and I serve as the Chief Financial Officer for Tavy Schools. And for stating uh, full disclosure, I live in town. I graduated from Tavy High School, as a matter of fact, in 1997, and uh, my wife and I have three boys who attend Tavy Schools. But as being a school district representative, I am neutral. Louder. Louder, Tony. I'll speak directly into the microphone. Perfect. Thank you, Patty. All right, so what I will attempt to cover here in my time is um, this, is this outline, is how we got here, what transpired to get to the referendum, why it matters, what it means for our schools or what it could mean for our schools, and where to learn more. And it's been a long, winding road. It started in 2017. We put together, the Board of Education decided that it was time to take a close look at our schools, put together a group of stakeholders that included citizens from across the community to do so. Batavia, as a matter of fact, Batavia Schools has a long history of doing so, convening building commissions, facilities commissions since the mid-1980s. The current master plan that we developed that started in 2017 was a result of the work that those <coughs> commissions had done since the early 80s and culminated with the additions to Batavia High School in 2009. And so in the interim, there wasn't much of a facilities plan that existed at that point because the work of those committees had concluded. And then the Great Recession happened and the district was struggling mightily with its finances and it well, it didn't make any sense to really have a master plan because there wasn't anything there to do. There wasn't money available to do much with. But knowing that we had to move forward with our schools, we convened this committee, and we did it with this relatively small group of folks taking a look at things around the district, and what we decided at the conclusion of it was is that we needed help. We needed professional help to take a very close look at our schools because what we didn't want to do was throw good money after bad. The example that I like to use most often is H.C. Storm School. H.C. Storm, and I'll come back to it often through this presentation, but H.C. Storm was built in 1978 along with Louise White School. And it's a very fine school, it looks great, has curb appeal from the street, uh, but it has a number of issues that it faces in modern times that we need to deal with, and including uh, when you first walk into that building, you walk right into basically the lunchroom before you enter into the office. And so with security in modern times, uh, you know, of course you have to buzz in to get into the school, but the, those that work in the office have to make sure that after you're buzzed in the door, you come directly to that office, because otherwise you can help yourself to the rest of the, of the school, which um, makes folks uncomfortable with our modern security posture. So that's just one issue. But And we could solve that probably fairly easily. We could put an addition on the front of that school and probably cost something on the order of two to maybe four, maybe five million dollars. Uh, but there are other issues with that school, including the parking lot. The uh, bus traffic, car traffic, pedestrian traffic, all cross in a single place as you enter that school. It has one single parking lot, which is another problem that we could solve relatively easily with probably another two, three, four, maybe five million dollars. Um, but if we were to go and put that security vestibule on the front of that school and didn't consider the parking lot, well, you know, we might be moving our security vestibule in the future because we don't necessarily have $10 million available at any given time to address things. But it keeps going. Inside that school, um, our, the way it was built, it was it's built with uh, modular design, with steel walls that hang from the rafters that were intended to be movable. And they literally hang. Uh, and with our current fire code, we have to put door closers on doors now, whereas that wasn't the case when it was built. And the walls kind of sway a little bit. And the doors, as they close, they'll buckle and they'll bind. And literally, classroom doors won't shut and lock as a result of the way that these walls were constructed. So they need to be replaced. We also can't put more electricity in these walls because they're, they're literally not permanent. The roof is original to the building in 1978, and we take good care of it. We do maintenance on it every year so that it doesn't leak, but it's at the end of its useful life it needs to be replaced. Probably another $4 million. Um, the floors need to be replaced. The ceilings, the doors, the walls, all these sorts of things add up 
and there's an extensive amount of work that needs to be done to keep this school usable in its modern form. And we did the math on all this work, and it's quite expensive. Suffice to say, we did all this work from a master planning perspective in all of our schools, and we try to figure out where is it best to invest our money so that we're not throwing good money after bad, we're not putting a security vestibule on HC Storm School without coming back in five, 10, or 15 years and literally moving the door where that security vestibule would be, or the parking lot, and so forth, so that we have an actual master plan. So we hired architects in 2019, and we kept working with uh, our stakeholders. We um, looked at all of our schools and figured out all the kind of the big picture projects of what school is today and what it might be tomorrow and what work needs to be done. We held the community engagement sessions in 2022. We gathered as many people in the community as would listen and have dialogue and conversations about what we want our schools to look like and what we want them to be now and in the future. And we looked at three different options. We looked at um, option A would be, you know, we kind of do what we do with Band-Aid approach to, uh, to taking care of our schools, which is what we're doing right now. We looked at the possibility of uh, keeping taxes level because we're about to pay off our, our, all of our outstanding debt in 2025 and 2026. And we looked at the possibility of increasing property taxes and what that would look like in terms of what kind of facilities we could offer to our schools. And that culminated in the referendum that we held in November. That November referendum, as you probably well know, was, did not pass. It uh, failed by 24 votes. We did a post-referendum uh, analysis as to why that might have been the case. We did surveys, and many people participated in the survey. Um, as a matter of fact, more people participated in that survey than did the surveys when we were talking about finalizing this master facilities plan. And overwhelmingly, people told us, one, that we should put this a uh, referendum back on the ballot here in April, and two, that there was a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication uh, in the community about what this referendum really meant for our schools, which is why we're here today. We're to distill it down to why this particular referendum matters for Batavia schools. It's about a better learning environment, safety and security, and protecting our investment. So in terms of a better learning environment, a lot of our schools were designed in a different time, and we do our very best to keep up with times with our how we operate our facilities relative to what our students need these days. But things are changing, particularly in the way of special education. It used to be that um, if a student had special needs, especially intense special needs, we would all, what we do is outplace them, meaning that we would send them to another school in another community or another school district to meet their needs, and increasingly. Uh, in modern times, we bring as many of these students back to our schools as possible so that we can serve their needs in our own schools with our own staff so that they're with their neighborhood peers to the extent possible. That requires more space, and it also requires um, specialized facilities, which we make work, but they're not necessarily designed and aligned with those needs. And over time, we need to make some improvements so that that is, in fact, the case. So that's one major aspect of a better learning environment. We're also doing more by way of career and technical education and making sure that those facilities meet students' needs so that, especially when students don't necessarily go off to college, that they're getting the learning experiences that they need to go off to careers. Protecting our community investment, in particular that HC Storm example that I was just talking about, doing the math on all the work that needs to be done at that school, if we were to just renovate it, it would cost 10 to $12 million more per school than it would be to rebuild new. And people are shocked when they hear that, but it's really the case. And one of the key reasons is, is because when we're doing that extent of renovation to a school, all the old life, health, life, life safety codes that we don't have to comply with necessarily today come due once you get past renovating 50% of a school. So um, it gets much more expensive. And then lastly, safety and security. I mentioned Storm 2, where we want to make sure that we have some secure vestibules on each of these schools, and there's a number of schools that don't have them yet. We build our schools in sister pairs uh, for our elementary schools. Each elementary school that we build for, in historically since 1955, um, there's almost another identical one on the other side of town. And so when one school needs work, in fact, two need work. And so uh, we've got a number of schools that need work, including Storm and Louise, I said, is where we're building. Spritolo and um, the high school, 
the middle school and the high school would both get $25 million of work each and totals $130 million, even though we're asking for 140. But what I want to leave you with is I'm losing time here. I'm down to the waning seconds. This referendum is for all eight of our schools. It's not just for Louise White and Storm, which are going to be rebuilt, or proposing rebuilt. That if we were to do so, we'd likely save 10 to $12 million each. This is the longest we've gone in town without a referendum. So the last time we passed a referendum at Batavia was 2007. It's the longest we've done gone without one since 1954. And that's how we fund major work in our schools. Um, our elementary enrollment isn't going to decline any more than it is. It might bounce around a little bit, but we're at a, basically a stable level. Enrollment is declining at our high school level, and we'll talk more about that, I'm sure, in your questions. And this um, referendum represents 10% of our school taxes. So if, um, if the referendum fails, taxes would go down by 10%. If it passes, we'd keep that referendum low moving forward. And since I'm out of time, I will pass the microphone off. If you'd like to learn more, you certainly can visit our website, bps101.net slash referendum. Raise your hand if you want a card. We'll come to you. Okay, our next speaker for opening statements is Juliana Cancelo, rep representing the four position. <laughs> I can get my dad title, so I can. Here. Oh, thank you. I'll move that out. Can everyone hear me? All right, good evening, and thank you to the League of Women Voters for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, as was said, my name is Juliana Cancello. I am a 22 year resident of Batavia a Batavia small business owner, and a product like Tony of BPS 101 Schools. Uh, but tonight I come to you as a member of the Yes for BPS 101 Referendum Committee as its co-treasurer, uh, but more importantly as the mother of a two-year-old who as of now is slated to begin her public ed school education at H.C. Storm Elementary, <laughs> which is great given everything Tony just talked about H.C. Storm, and she'll be graduating the class of 2038 which is right now an unfathomable number and a distant future, but her future begins to take shape tonight and will be clarified in April when we head to the ballot box. Tonight, I represent a committee of Batavians who came together to advocate for a yes vote for BPS District 101 school building referendum. This referendum seeks to raise $140 million for better schools. Um, as was mentioned, the projects include rebuilding two elementary schools, repairing the middle school, the high school, and the re remaining elementary schools. The referendum represents a fiscally responsible plan to ensure a better, safer, more equitable future for our students. Tonight, I hope I can share with you, first, the community origins of this plan, second, the vast problems facing our schools from safety and security to a dignified learning environment, and finally, I want to talk about the clear solution, voting yes for BPS on April 4th. Um, when I volunteered to speak to you tonight, I sat down to write my thoughts on what that meant and what I wanted to convey to my community. First, an incredible honor that my fellow committee members chose me as the representative. I do not take that lightly, and believe me, I could be at yoga right now, so. <laughs> <laughs> big, big day for me. And second, I reflected on the journey that led us to this evening. Uh, two years ago, I was selected to join the Building Our Future Together Committee, uh, which ultimately led to the creation of the Referendum Committee. I sat with a committee made up of Batavians through thought-provoking discussions as we sifted through data and feedback from community engagement sessions and set out to formulate a plan on how to best serve our community, its youth, and the adults who foster them. Every community member was invited to participate in our community engagement sessions. People from all areas of Batavia, including members of the No Campaign, participated in these engagement sessions. We listened to our fellow Batavians discuss the different plans and approaches, and the feedback received via those sessions, along with anonymous surveys, led us to present the fiscally responsible plan to the Board of Education. The Board agreed to put this plan on the ballot, twice. Good communities create good plans, and good communities pass good plans, like this referendum. We have a responsibility to our children to show them what it means to be a good Batavian. 
The YES Committee continues to advocate for this community-generated, fiscally responsible plan to ensure the safety and well-being of our students. It was a pleasure to be a part of the community origins of this plan, truly. It, it, was, it was an unbelievable privilege. Those community origins created a plan that built a safe, equitable learning environment for our students. It will help us maintain the reputation our schools have and have built over decades and will continue to instill pride in our community. Let's take a look at some of the problems our school are facing. Um, I know Tony briefed that, but I do have, I do have more. Um, our schools face a variety of issues that require larger scale solutions that fall outside of regular maintenance and maintenance budgets. Two of our elementary schools, as was mentioned, H.C. Storm and Louise White, have such issues that have become too costly to maintain. These schools require a complete reconstruction as the existing issues are too costly to maintain. While it might seem that a renovation would be more cost effective, the reality is that fixing these issues will lead to even more renovations as local and federal building codes would be triggered. The plan's budget, as was mentioned, would allocate $25 million for the give or take, for the construction of new schools at H.E. Storm and at Lewis White, and the remainder would be allocated amongst remaining projects. Several of our schools have extreme safety shortcomings. Three of our elementary schools lack locked entrance vestibules. Two of our schools have vulnerable areas that expose early childhood education classrooms to the main entrances. Three of our schools lack control over their main entrances, and two have bad sight lines from the doors to the main offices. Many schools have traffic congestion, congestion issues, and some of our schools do not have sprinklers. Some of our schools don't have sprinklers, and Tony mentioned fire codes that have already not that are already not meeting conditions, right? The community and experts all agree these make for less safe schools. Several schools are no longer meeting construction, building, and operating codes. H.C. Storm, for example, as was mentioned, we can't add electricity due to the movable walls. So there's not enough power to support the use of more electricity, and thus they cannot support a robotics or coding program, which have become vital next-generation subjects for our children's education. Others need updated HVAC systems or have old windows, floors, roofs, and finishes. I think you're beginning to see the problems we have that this referendum will fix. Um, H.C. Storm and Louise White's uh, movable walls compromise security and prevent electrical upgrades from being performed. J.B. Nelson needs additional handicap accessible doors. This means that today, all children do not have full access to their own school. A community member recently posted photos of the flooding surrounding one of the elementary schools after a rainy day. When it rains, the effects are felt for days afterwards at these schools as children can't play outside due to flooding. Voting yes on April 4th will improve safety and security. It is an effective use of taxpayer dollars. This plan will create a better, more equitable, prideful learning environment for students with better programs. And lastly, it will protect community investments. We cannot afford to fail our students, teachers, faculty, and staff. Students and teachers are currently strained working in difficult conditions and will continue to do so until this funding is secured. Voting yes on April 4th is the responsible solution to the problems I just outlined. Maintenance approaches are band-aid fixes that will prove more costly in the long term. Attempting to fix issues under our operational budget will, at best, kick the issue down the road, and we will find ourselves in the same place. If we continue to ignore the needed changes and we fall into a drastic situation beyond the learning impacts, it is likely we will see an impact on property values. Families move to Batavia for our culture, our small businesses, and above all, our schools. I know my parents did, and I remain here, <laughs> uh, married to a fourth generation Batavian with our fifth generation future bulldog. A crumbling school will make your house worth less. The time to act is now. The fiscally responsible option is available to us now, today. At no additional cost, we can secure a bright future for our children and fix our crumbling schools. We talked about the community origins of the referendum, and we did a brief review of the clear needs our children have, and we discussed why this referendum here now is the right solution for these problems. The choice is clear. Vote yes on April 4th. Early voting began March 10th. We urge you all to go to the ballot box having made an informed decision. Today is the 13th in case anyone needs a reminder. Whether or not you know a student in the DPS 101 system, your decision will impact their life. Tonight, I ask you to consider the facts and vote for a better, safer, more equitable future for our young Batavians. 
our vote gives voice to a child who cannot yet make that decision for herself, but who deserves our attention nonetheless. Thank you. Do I have time left? Perfect. I do have a couple images of the existing problems that we talked about in case anyone hasn't seen, um, hasn't been inside a school in a long time, as I'm sure many of you have. Tony, was there a trick to this? Uh, I think I'm a mind reader because Tony, I highlighted the congestion problem that you talked about, Louise White. That is the intersection where cars, buses, and pedestrians meet. This is the vestibule that Tony spoke about at each storm. That is the locked door once you're buzzed in. Uh, that's your route to the office. And as Tony said, you would have an opportunity to roam about the building. This is HC Storm. On Van Norwick. Yes. Great. This is a photo of Louise White, which is a similar. Perfect. I'll come through. Um, these are some of the uh, measures that current uh, staff and students have taken um, in the midst of the shortcomings that their schools have. Uh, this is a footage taken from a video. Uh, a teacher came to school one day and saw that her classroom was misting. Uh, it soaked everything, and she absolutely mentioned uh, the work that the district did and the, and the um, support staff to repair her classroom, but she lost valuable time and valuables. Um, she mentioned material items that she had collected throughout the years throughout her travels that were, were ruined. This happened towards the end of the semester, and it really impacted uh, their testing and, and, and their, their learning time. Um, this is rain that fell through uh, into the copy room. Those are the spaces in the walls that you can see at H.E. Storm and Louise White. Uh, this is a lack of um, storage. Um, the storage that used to be used for this got reallocated for different purposes as the school continued to grow. So storage facilities then became offices. This was the stage at Louise White or Please wait, thank you. It is now the custodian's uh, closet and office. Um, these are stains, stains, floor crackings, and outdated HVAC systems. All right. And outdated furniture. <coughs> thank you. Presenting um, the third opening remarks is Sylvia Capel for, for Batavians for a Responsible Government, the against position. Hi, I'm Sylvia Keppel, spokesperson for Batavians for Responsible Government. Our position is simple. Vote no to the $140 million referendum. Vote no to make the school board come back with smaller, well-defined referenda. The current referendum wording is so vague that nothing must be done and anything can be done in capital projects. They can even build a second artificial turf field identified to cost $5.6 million in the like-to-do category. They may say, a second artificial turf field is not on the high priority list, but the first artificial turf field was not on the high priority list either. In fact, the Capital Projects Committee recommended against the first turf field, and the board went and approved it anyway. There was something like $350 million worth of projects identified by DLR Group. Less than half of the projects will be covered by $140 million. Which projects will be selected? We don't really know. This is a $140 million blank check to be used by the school board however it wants, no guarantees. Vote no to a blank check. I will acknowledge there are things that the district needs which would not fall under the annually budgeted capital projects fund. Security, for example. Forty years ago, no one would have thought there would be mass shootings in schools. It is very easy for the board to put a referendum on the ballot. If the board were to come to the voters with a referendum that stated, 
shall bonds in the amount of $12 million be issued for the purpose of securing the entrances of the schools of Batavia Community Unit School District 101. That would be an easy yes vote. The citizens of the district really truly care about the children and their safety. Think we need two new schools? Put that to a $70 million referendum. Expanded special ed facilities? Put it to a separate referendum. Give us specifics to vote on. Without specifics in the language of the referendum, defining and limiting what the money can be used for, we urge voters to vote no. We don't have a money problem, we have a management problem. The school district is focusing on the wrong things. Compared to Geneva and St. Charles, Batavia spends the most money per student. We pay the highest salaries to teachers and administrators. Little Batavia. The joke when I moved into Batavia 25 years ago was St. Charles is old money, Geneva is new money, and Batavia is no money. But Batavia now spends $17,620 per student per year, 700 more per student than Geneva, and almost $1,000 more than St. Charles. Yet Batavia's students have the lowest test scores in the Tri-Cities. Throwing more money at buildings will not fix English language arts where only 40% of students are proficient. Vote no and tell the district to refocus its priorities on education first. The next priority should be securing and maintaining what we already have through responsible budgeting. Her school buildings were built off the backs of taxpayers. That the district is arguing the schools built only 44 years ago are in such poor condition that they need to be rebuilt screams of negligence. Why should we reward the school district for negligence? It sure looks to me like they purposely let buildings fall into disrepair so they can cry poor and get more sympathy in a referendum. So are they lacking money? Or are they spending money on the wrong things, not putting enough money into needs instead of wants? After all, they voted to spend over $2 million for new bleachers over the summer. Well, I found the quintessential average $350,000 house on Millview Drive. In the last 19 years, the years available online at Kane County Clerk's Office, in the last 19 years, the home's value increased 36%, but the homeowner's school property taxes increased 94%. 94%, almost double in less than 20 years. All the other taxing bodies combined only raised their taxes 56%. At the same time, the extension of the total amount of tax dollars the school district collects increased 155%, from $33 million to $83 million per year, a $50 million increase, even as enrollment is declining. Less students should mean less cost. The board raises taxes the maximum amount every year, with no plans to stop this practice. In case you're curious, the owners of that average home paid the school district over 19 years $108,000. Batavia School District is not lacking in money. It's too bad our property tax bills will come after the April 4th election because the school board in December voted to add over 5% or about $5 million more to their levy and higher property taxes for us. How much do they say the $140 million bonds would cost? $9.1 million per year. And they will get $5 million more dollars in tax hikes this year. Another year with high inflation, like in 2022, and they would have another $5 million from the taxes we have no voice in, no vote for. Together, that's $10 million extra per year, more than the $9.1 million extra they're looking for in the referendum. That's plenty for the district to properly take care of its assets. Vote no to this referendum, and let the district use its ample taxes to take care of most of the projects on their list, that fall under standard maintenance. There's one final topic to talk about, trust. Can we trust the school board to keep their promises? I would argue no. In 2007, the board promised if voters approved their $75 million referendum, it would not increase taxes. But four years later, they broke their promise. Two years after that, they had the chance to make things right when the Chicago Premium Outlets Mall started paying taxes to BPS 101. Did they use any of that money to lower residents' property taxes to the promised level? No. They raked in over $70 million in increases ta increased taxes that year without any thought for the taxpayers they cheated, who filled the meeting room and wrote to the board. The board that broke the promise felt no responsibility to the promises made by a past board. Neither does the current board feel any responsibility. And so it goes. No promise by a school board will necessarily be upheld by a future board because there is no sense of obligation handed from one to the other. The board now says that they will keep the bond and interest levy payments at $9.1 million per year, even if that means bonding for less than $140 million. The referendum says nothing 
about $9.1 million payments. It only specifies $140 million in bonds. Bonds and interest must be paid, with no limit as to the rate or amount that taxes can be increased to pay for them. There is nothing but their word to hold them to their promise, and as we've seen in the not-so-distant past, their word doesn't count for much, especially as the board members change. If you want to be sure your taxes won't go up without limit, vote no. To their credit, the district recently added a tax calculator to their website, but how many people go to their website? The mailer they sent out, the way most people will hear about the referendum, couldn't even mention the amount it will cost the average household. $726 on a $350,000 home, by the way. Why not be honest and tell people what it will cost them, with a chart of the cost per home value, so they can make an informed decision? We have a chart on our website at b4rg.org. If the board can't be honest and transparent in saying up front, this is what it will cost you, but we think it's worth it. Is it really worth it? Or are they being deceitful and using rhetoric that tries to minimize the financial impact of voters for projects of questionable value? What about the district's promotional materials? Are those accurate and helpful for making an informed decision? No. Take, for example, the videos they posted. Video 2 shows the school secretary explaining how a pipe burst and water poured onto the workroom office equipment with a short video clip from the incident. Then in video 5, the same video clip of the burst pipes is played with a voiceover saying, at HC Storm School, when it rains outside, sometimes it rains inside. It can't be both a burst pipe and a leaky roof. This is a perfect example of what they're doing to try to play an emotion to create a sense of urgency and being dishonest while doing so. Pipes break in our homes as well as in our schools, but we don't tear down our homes when these things happen. We call the plumber. So should we trust the district when they say they need new buildings now? I don't. Vote no and make the school board come back with smaller specific referenda so their plans can be scrutinized and verified. To sum up, the referendum before us is exceedingly vague in both what it proposes to deliver and what it will truly cost. That is not something Batavians for Responsible Government can support. We therefore urge voters to vote no. Let the school district come back to voters with smaller, specific referenda that we can weigh on their merits. April 4th, vote no. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you presenters. Can you hear me okay? Okay, that's my segue into please. Um, I will give a brief reminder to withhold your applause, um, whether in support or opposition against, to keep this a neutral space. Thank you. That concludes our first portion of this two-segment format. Um, the questions, I have reviewed the questions received from you tonight. I am going to attempt to, we have a good amount of them. Thank you very much. I've always said that the difference between a good forum and a wanting forum is the quality of the questions. So I commend you on them and submitting the questions. Please keep them coming. We'll fit in as many as we can. In that effort, I have consolidated what I view as duplicative questions, along with <coughs> consulting with the questions order volunteers. Um, so if your question isn't asked word for word, I've tried to combine it into, you've had a very popular question. It's been combined with other people, fellow audience members. And with that being said, the way that this question and answer format will be conducted is that many of the questions upon review really relate to wanting more specific information from the school presenters, which is not surprising. So most of them, I will start with the school presenters, um, pose the questions to you. You will have one minute to provide as much information as you feel relevant and helpful and, and factually. And then each uh, representative of the for and against side will have a minute to add their thoughts on, um, and positions to the same question. So we are going to be asking, the first question is, um, has to do with economic, the economic state that we live in these days. And it is, um, I will pose it to the school presenters first for one minute. Is this the right or the wrong economic environment for this referendum? Um, if you want to expand on that into why now versus at some point in the future, we want to take a minute to do that. Uh, 
this um, this master plan process and the building process that goes along with it isn't something that you can just snap your fingers and make happen. It's something that we've been working for now for um, seven years. And uh, it will take another five years to fully execute that plan. So it is certainly a long arc. Uh, the, um, a lot of the questions about why we don't have more details revolves around the amount of work that would be invested in having architects and engineers actually develop plans, which is quite costly. And uh, it certainly takes many years to do. And uh, we can't invest the money into this amount of work. It would be literally many millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars, to, to make these designs and then put them into action. And we want to make sure that this is something that the community does, in fact, want. The other aspect about the economics is it's not going to happen overnight. Um, in fact, we'd be issuing these bonds, this up to $140 million in bonds, over the full duration of the plan, and so that probably be over five years, we'd be issuing them in batches, and so it actually extends out and minimizes the exposure to the economics of the time. So, that's the gist of it. Thank you. I am going to switch this up since Sylvia was uh, so gracious to agree to the third position due to the lat draw. I would like to offer you the first um, input for one minute into that question. I would say no, this is not the right time to have such a referendum. The cost of everything is so high, and they call, including the cost of construction, and the interest on the bonds were not given. So the, they're making a promise to only spend $9.1 million per year, which might mean bonding for less than the $140 million. And the greater the cost of the interest, the greater the chance is that they will bust through that limit and go for the whole $140 million. And then our taxes could go up without limit. So no, I would say this is not the time people are taxed and their spending, gas prices are high, the eggs prices are high, food prices are high. This is not the time to ask people to give more. It should be the time to give people a break. And Juliana. Yeah. So I think Tony touched on this, but the funding would be secured in phases. Um, and I, if I understand correctly, the debt can be restructured to, um, uh, it can be refinanced to, um, take advantage of better interest rates as we get down the, down the line. Um, as far as, it's like, I mean, yes, the, the needs are great. The time is now. We have a chance to reissue debt without change, without increasing our taxes right now. Thank you. We'll move on to the second question. This um, was touched on in the opening presentation by Tony, but I want to prove it since it was asked by several um, cards submitted. I wanted to see if you wanted to provide more detail on it, Tony. Um, and it's really two parts. I've combined it. What specific issues, if any, do the two elementary schools have that require them to be torn down rather than replaced? That would be the first part. And the second is, if Storm and White schools are torn down and rebuilt, what energy efficiency plans are being considered for implementation? By way of example, solar, geothermal, Will they be net zero buildings? Uh, I don't think I can do those questions justice in a minute. But, um, it's a lot. Uh, yeah, the, um, we add up the total amount of work that needs to be done in those schools, as I mentioned earlier. If you were to simply renovate them to the full extent, and it would cost under 10 to $12 million or more. The reason why rebuilding them makes more sense is that it puts more money overall back into education versus taking care of these schools over time. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a number of issues with those buildings in particular. Once we renovate more than 50% of a, the square footage of a school or it costs more than 50% of the replacement value, we have to install things like sprinklers. Those buildings aren't sprinkled. Do uh, ADA compliance for restrooms and doors and install a tornado shelter, which none of our schools have. And so, in fact, most of our schools, by the way, aren't sprinkled as of right now. But um, it, there's, it gets really complicated, and um, what it boils down to is we've come up with a master plan and a grand scheme of things that we think will save Batavian money rather than chasing one small project after the next. We can do small projects one at a time, but the reality is, is that that will cost more money in the long run, and we will throw good money after bad moving things around if, uh, rather than having an actual master plan that puts all this stuff together. 
That's what it boils down to. And it, the longer we wait, the more expensive it gets. School construction costs have increased by 30% in the last year, and they're not going to go back in the other direction. I'm fairly confident of that. So the longer we wait, the more it will take, the more it will cost for us to do this work. And we will rotate between the for and against positions for what I'll call, for want of a better word, rebuttal answers. Julia, I don't want you to yeah. speak to that. Um, I don't think that I can answer the net zero question. Um, I do know the district partners with the great uh, architects and builders. Um, I'm sure that that's something that will be taken into consideration. Um, I know that the building materials and the, and the um, technology that's available today is way more efficient than it was 50, 60 years ago. Um, can you repeat the other half of the question? Sure. What specific issues do the two elementary schools have, if any, that require them to be torn down rather than replaced? Sure. So Tony and I talked about how building codes uh, would be triggered by any changes um, and the, um, the movable walls which even prevent uh, electrical upgrades from being performed. Um, and as Tony said, by the time you renovate 50%, you spend all of that, all that budget. Oh, well, I think one thing to note would be uh, that these schools will be um, rebuilt uh, in parallel. Uh, so these children would not be displaced while the construction is taking place. The construction will be taking place literally next door. So we are not talking about having to bus children to a different location or teachers having to be displaced um, for, for the school year. Thank you. Sylvia? My answer to whether or not they need to be torn down is I don't know. I would like to see a specific render referendum that addresses that very issue. I've heard from a couple of different people, um, one who went through the DLR group, and the DLR group seemed to find a lot of things in there that previous capital projects uh, committees have not found. And what are we renovating to, 10 to $12 million more? Is that the their so-called ideal school? Or is it just fixing the classrooms, fixing those movable walls, fixing the uh, electricity problem, fixing the vestibule? We don't really know. I have the feeling that DLR group exaggerates the needs of, of remodeling and the cost of remodeling. So I would really like to see that fleshed out in a separate referendum for just those two schools. Thank you. Moving on to the third question, we're switching gears to the middle schools now. Sorry, can they answer the net zero question? Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I don't think anybody touched on that. Okay, thank you um, for directing it to me. Also, thank you for that. Would anybody else, does any, does, do any three of you have anything to add to the net zero question? I will try. Um, when we did our master planning process, and we involved stakeholders, we looked at things like um, net zero and uh, energy efficiency, and while we want to go in that direction and make them as energy efficient as possible, uh, net zero has costs associated with it that we can't necessarily afford. So we would push the you know, the extent of energy efficiency as far as we can without breaking the bank. Thank you. Good. Okay. We'll move on to the middle schools now. We have talked about the elementary schools. Um, this real question, I think, really could be answered by all three of you. So I. But we'll start with Tony, just as a about some facts. What are the biggest needs that the referendum seeks to fund at the middle school and at the high school? Uh, the biggest needs at the middle school and the high school uh, start with the special education facilities. Um, those are spaces that um, we use, um, those, the students who have special needs use every day, and they're in spaces that weren't designed to meet their needs. We have um, more students in those schools now than was originally conceived of, and um, the, the facilities aren't adequate for those needs. And so it starts with special education. At the middle school in particular, uh, there are traffic flow issues, or uh, the way that that building was designed and the number of students that are in it exceeds its the, kind of the core capacity of the building. Um, the restroom facilities and locker facilities are in need of uh, modernization and upgrades. And let's see what else off the top of my head. Oh, science labs. Um, for example, at the middle school, sixth grade doesn't have a science lab. Uh, we'd like to see them have one. And the labs across the building at all levels are uh, woefully out of date and need renovations. And then um, the LR LRCs, the libraries, need extensive renovations as well. Okay, Tony, since this is a meaty question, do you need it for further time to go over anything? Uh, I want to make sure we do it justice. 
we're talking about the middle schools and the high schools. Yeah, the, uh, the LRCs, I would add to that list, and, then, and that's probably the vast majority of it. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll repeat the question for both. Uh, we'll go with Sylvia next, as she's up first in the rotational order that we'll do between the two sides. What are the biggest needs that the referendum seeks to fund at the middle school and at the high school, if any, that you see? It's really hard to say because we don't really know what the referendum is funding. There are no specifics. Yes, in the middle school, I've seen the uh, special education facilities, and they need some work. But there's no specificity as to what is going to be done with those. It's nice to say we need better, but what better? What is are they, will they be an addition onto the building? Uh, and again, with all these other issues, what specifically will be done? What will be done? And is there a guarantee? And you don't have a guarantee on what needs to be done. Thank you. We'll move on. Oh, I'm so sorry, Julie. Oh, please, go ahead. Your input. I'm going to echo the ADA accessibility and, um, and the needs. Um, I can personally remember um, Fellow students uh, in our middle school, uh, when I was in middle school, um, they had to wait until the end of the passing period to be able to go from one uh, room to the other so that they uh, they wouldn't be caught in traffic. Um, and as we discussed, the, the needs um, that, that need to be, uh, the classrooms that need to be adapted to their needs. Um, and the classrooms that serve, serve a purpose now that was different from the purpose for which they were designed. Um, I was an orchestra student who played in a cafetorium for many years, and our orchestra room was a former science lab that still had outlets in the floor. Thank you, Juliana. Now we'll move on. What the question will post this to Tony first. What are the security upgrades being proposed? How are these decided on? Who has input into them? Security upgrades being proposed. So the security upgrades focus primarily on those schools that don't have those secure vestibules. We want all of our schools to, um, when visitors come, they go through the main office and they can't get into the building without going through that main office and having interacting with a human directly. We also want to improve the, the sight lines for the main office. So even our newer schools don't quite have this. They, while they may have secure vestibules, they don't have good sight lines to the perimeter of the building. So like a, uh, Grace McWayne and Hoover Wood School, um, they were built in 2001. You can't get into that building without getting buzzed in the first door and then getting buzzed into a second door. Um, but the office is tucked back behind, um, like the principal's office, for example, and you can't see outward to the street. We want to make sure that the offices have a good understanding of what, and where the secretary in particular in the schools can see what's going on, whether a bus shows up late, something as simple as that, or what activity is happening outside the school, uh, because um, maintaining that situational awareness is the very first and most important thing when it comes to say, the school safety and security. You don't want to wait until a threat is on top of you before you know that something's happening. And Juliana, you'll be next up. Yeah, um, I mean, I can speak personally to it. I dropped off food at H.C. Strong the other day, and the secretary met me outside, and I was just bringing food. Um, the, the sight line is, is, a, is a huge, huge problem, and the distance between the locked, I, I was buzzed in, um, but the distance between the locked door and her desk is, is great. Okay, Sylvia, so, I'd like to change up the question just slightly to reflect that you are in the against position, and that would be, um, do you see any security upgrades that are necessary to be proposed? As I mentioned the opening statement, I think security is very important. My question would be, why hasn't it been done already? Because the shootings have happened for years, many years now. That should have been a high priority, a high priority in the school district's budget. And they, they increase their taxes every year. Much of that should have gone to improving the security and the safety in the past. But it's not done, and if there were a specific referendum for just safety and security, I would be willing to bet that most occasions would look for that. Thank you, Sylvia. This is a general question. I think some, some of the follow-up questions I will do might bear down a little bit more specific depending on the answer. 
Um, it has to do, and I'll just ask it, what aspects of the proposed new buildings will most lead to increased learning? I think, Tony, you're the logical person to start with on this one. With what aspects of the proposed new buildings will most lead to increased learning? The aspects of the new buildings, meaning the storm and the leaves of the building, is that what you're referring to? I think that's what the question is getting at, yes. Um, well, there's a lot of things about Storm and Louise in particular when they were built that has changed in terms of the way that we do things. Um, one, just by way of, of traffic. You know, traffic around all of our elementary schools is problematic and that's not necessarily going to go away, but when you look at Storm, uh, all traffic coming in one single entrance is inherently problematic and so we want to address that. Uh, but that gives an indication of how much has changed too, is that you know, parents uh, you can either walk to school or you're dropped off by your parents or you take a bus and um, a lot has changed outside of our schools, but you think about how much has changed inside. Uh, walking, literally walking in the entrance is, is different, you know, controlling visitors, having collaborative spaces for teachers and students to use, uh, it's not necessarily, you know, a, a desks in rows and columns anymore. We have collaborative spaces where students can work together on projects and these projects change over time and having furniture that's flexible for them to do that. And a lot of our students spend a lot of time on the floor of our classrooms. Not that that's inherently bad, but it's just not spaces designed for how they work and learn today. And certainly, we're not even having begun to talk about technology. So in the, the minute span that I have, I just touched on the surface of the, the nature of the issue, and I would love to talk more about it, but I don't see the stop sign here. We'll see if we can drill down to more specifics and some follow-ups. Um, Sylvia, you are next up in the rotational order. Would you like me to repeat it? I've got it. Okay. As Tony said, a lot has changed and will continue to change, but we must be aware of fads. When our schools were built, they were all arranged, they were the modern school buildings, and now we find that those movable walls that were supposed to be great were never moved. We're finding those risers in the band room are not so practical and they would like them out. So if we build something new, if we renovate, are we just going to be meeting the fads of today that will be impractical 20 years from now? We'll have another referendum wanting to renovate the whole school again. Um, the other thing is with the collaborative learning, that wouldn't have worked with COVID. If you have big tables where everybody sits around a big table and now you have to separate people by six feet, what would have happened if our schools had all been built for collaborative learning? You have to be aware of the fads, be practical. Thank you, Sylvia. Juliana? Sure. Welcoming, inviting, equitable classrooms are essential to learning. A child needs to be safe, feel safe and secure, and safety and security are conducive to learning. Our students deserve access to technological advancements in order to prepare them for the modern world. Okay, we'll move on to the next question. We're going to try to do a couple more specifics on the same question. <coughs> the literature in indicates that science STEM studios are planned for Gustafson, McWayne, Hoover Wood, and Nelson schools. What are the unique features of such a room? What current spaces will be used for these studios? Tony? I'm happy to repeat it. I think I have it. Um, a STEM space, in case you're you don't know what STEM is. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Mathematics. Sometimes it's called STEAM and includes art as well. These spaces are more flexible classrooms where science instruction can take place. We don't have dedicated classrooms for science instruction at any of our elementary schools. And that's not to say that our students aren't learning science, of course, but there are certain spaces that can help them learn these things that um, allow for project-based learning, that can support science-type experiments and um, other ex uh, type of work that uh, make for a better learning experience for our students. But it's essentially a space that's designated for a, a class to go to and have a um, furniture and equipment and supplies and materials that are at the ready for this type of learning. Hey, Juliana, you're next up in the rotation. Yeah, I, I just, a personal note, I, I wonder if, I have, my father has worked at Vermilla for many years. And I wonder if access to some classrooms would have uh, inspired me to go to science rather than, <laughs> than making food. Sylvia. 
have a background. My major, my degree is in biology, and I'm a minor in chemistry. So I'm big into the sciences. But at the elementary level, I don't really think you need all that much special, special equipment, special gear. It's the beginning stages of learning, learning about science, learning about the basics, where creativity and a, a good curriculum sets the basis for a lifelong love of science. Middle school, high school, sure, they do a lot more. But for the elementary schools, I think the regular classrooms would be just fine. Thank you, Sylvia. Again, another more specific question. How will flexible and adaptable collaboration spaces look different than existing spaces? I think it, this was touched on, but if you'd like some more time, Tony, to address this. I'll try. Thank you. I'll try one. Um, I, I think that um, the collaborative spaces is more than just furniture. It really is having, talk, Tony talked a little bit about sight lines when it comes to safety, but also in the classroom, kids aren't working all on the same thing at the same time. So to be able to have that space, um, you know, adjacent to a classroom where a teacher could send a group of students so they're not sitting on the floor in the hallway, but the teacher can still have eyes on them and they'd be collaborating and doing different things because um, times have changed. 1994, when I started teaching at Batavia High School, they were all in rows and they all faced me and I had one lesson for everybody and that's not education today. Education today is meeting the students where they're at. They are constructing learning in different ways and so there might be a group of students working on something completely different than who they're sitting next to. And so we need opportunity to maybe move them to a different place where the teachers still have sight um, we do a lot of guided groups where they're working in different, um, my time is up, but guided groups, again, same thing, where we need different spaces for the kids all within sight of the teacher. Lisa, if there's anything you'd like a little more time, so to do it justice, please do. To put it up there. Okay. Uh, in that case, Sylvia, you are next up in the rotation. If you can speak on your input into the flexible and adaptable collaboration spaces. Uh, whether you feel they look different than existing spaces. Well, looking at the pictures that the district put on the website, I see a lot of wasted space. I see a lot of the extra space in the air to heat and to cool to drive up the energy costs for taxpayers. I see um, a larger spread out that may be harder for a teacher to reach all the students at the same time. Um, and you say that this is all, all necessary. Is this one of those fads? Are our children doing better on their, in their education? Are they learning more? I would venture to or hazard a guess that we might have learned more way back when, when we didn't have collaborative spaces, where a collaborative space was pushing desks together to do a project. Thank you. Juliana, would you like time on this? Sure. I just want to touch on Lisa's point about meeting students where they are. Um, I'm really excited about the opportunity that my child will have to have these uh, spaces that will that will meet her needs where she is. Um, I she learns something new every day. Her cha her needs change every single day. The ability for a teacher to be able to meld her his or her lesson plans to my child's needs are essential to continue progress in learning, advancement in learning, um, and having the um, the wealth of resources to be able to explore different things every day is, is, is really exciting. Okay, with that we're going to shift gears into more of the financial and economic and allocation aspects of the referendum uh, requested. And so the question is, what is the proposed allocation of funds to the various buildings? Is there a proposed allocation of funds and what is it among the various buildings? Yeah, there was a slide that I had in my deck that addressed that, although I ran low on time and I kind of glossed over it, but um, it would dedicate $30 million to the construction of the two new schools, so H.C. Storm and Louise White. It would dedicate $25 million for the middle school, about $25 million for the high school, and then $5 million for the remaining school, four schools, elementary schools, each. Okay. Juliana, would you like to speak to this? I'll just add that uh, contingency plans have been put in place for all those budgets as well. Tony? Yes. And Sylvia? I find it really interesting that equal amounts are going to be spent on elementary schools when J.B. Nelson was rated poorer than the two schools that they were on to tear down. 
So these allocations, and now they're talking 30 million, before it was 30, 35 million to tear down and rebuild the school. These numbers are fungible. They keep moving, they're fluid. I don't like the fluidness of it because you don't know what you're getting. And at 25 million, you could end up with a $5.6 million second artificial turf field. Give us a referendum with, that has specifics, that, that anchors what needs to be done, and give us a chance to vote on multiple referenda that will tell us exactly what will be done and at which schools. Okay, thank you. Along those same lines, if the referendum is approved and upgrades are completed, how will or should continued maintenance be managed? Uh, so, the challenge that we face is that um, when it comes to these larger projects, and when you're getting into a project that exceeds, I would say, $2 million and upwards of five, uh, there isn't a capacity in our operating budget to deal with the size of a project, which requires, as a result, a referendum and permission from the voters to move forward. So, uh, we are, uh, at post uh, 2008 and improving our finances, dedicating more of our budget toward maintaining our schools at present. In the current fiscal year, we're going to spend $2.8 million of our over $100 million budget toward on maintaining our schools, and our plan is to increase that amount by 15% per year. But as I mentioned earlier, construction inflation exceeded the 30% in the last year. So at present pace, we're not keeping up with the costs the increasing, rapidly increasing cost of property maintaining our schools. And so it is part of our operating budget and is every year, although there was a time there post the Great Recession that we had to literally stop taking good care of our schools because there just wasn't enough money in the budget. In fact, at one point, we were looking at the possibility of laying off up to 100 teachers, and we had to do everything we could to make ends meet, which is why the uh, outlet mall and the expiration of that related tip was so important to the finances of Batavia. Things were not good financially for Batavia schools. As a matter of fact, I know I'm out of time, but I'll keep going. Um, we used to borrow money every year for tax anticipation loans. And we literally, so it's effectively a payday loan. We have to borrow money so that we could make payroll and pay our bills to get through the fiscal year because we we're waiting for those taxes to come in. I'm proud to say that we made some pretty significant gains in terms of our finances in the last eight years, and we're in a much better financial position. Uh, and um, we are now actually putting reasonable amounts of money toward taking care of our schools. We have a long way to go. But the scope of the work that we have to do in front of us in terms of uh, why we need this referendum is it's not cheap. It's why we're asking for this referendum and why we're asking the, commuters what kind of the community what kind of schools they want. We've tried to build a master plan that saves the taxpayers as much as possible while maintaining what we believe the community's vision is for our schools. Kind of balancing that out. But that's the question we have before us. So, yeah, you are next, next up in the rotational order. Do you agree that that is something to look at? is correct. I've been watching the school district for some time, and under his guidance, it's the, the fiscal management has improved. But it's not there yet. The management at the district <coughs> is negligent in terms of the maintenance of the, what we have. And that's something that needs to be worked on. I, I would argue that they need to work more out of the budget that we have. Get some of the spending under control. Fix up those things that they've spent too much on um, that, that really shouldn't be. To work within their means, within their budget, with the very generous tax dollars that we already give them. Juliana? I'll reiterate that we presented a fiscally responsible plan to the board, which is at a healthy, healthy spot in order to take some. Okay, now the opposite scenario. If the referendum does not pass, are there funds available to provide essential repairs? Tony. Or Lisa. Okay. I'll give Tony a break. We do have, um, like Tony mentioned, the board does set aside funding for capital projects annually, but it is a, a fraction of the master plan and it would be, it would take decades more than that just to complete, if we, um, just to complete a portion of the master plan just with that part of the budget. And also schools require, new schools require the voters approval, so we would not be able to 
um, replace H.C. Storm and Louise White if the referendum doesn't pass. So we would be able to tackle some of those smaller projects every year within our budget, and um, but to be able to um, wipe the slate clean of a lot of these projects that would require the referendum, otherwise we're chipping away um, annually. Okay, Juliana, you're next up. Do you want to speak to the need for essential repairs if the referendum does not pass, or how you'd like to, that to be weighed? I don't feel comfortable enough adding it to what Lisa said. Okay, Sylvia? This referendum isn't the be-all and end-all of funding. They can always put another referendum on the ballot, something that is specific that people would vote for, something that for the essentials. Um, they are getting right now, they've increased their levy by $5 million this year. A substantial amount of that, if they choose to do so, could go toward, toward um, the capital projects fund. Um, if they have another, if we have another high interest year, we a uh, high CPI, we could have another $5 million next year because the school board always raises taxes the maximum amount allowed by law. So, yeah, but this referendum is not the end of, the, it's not the end of the world if you vote, no. They could just easily, by majority vote of the school board, put another another referendum on the ballot next time for something that people might actually vote for. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, we're, we are winding down to the two last questions. Uh, we will continue along the lines of the economic aspects. Um, can you discuss the relationship among the potential passage of the referendum, property taxes, property values, and property taxes? Tony or Lisa, I don't know if you want to speak to that scenario. To understand the question, what is the linkage between the property taxes? But the potential passage of the referendum, property values, and property taxes. Um, well, to put things in terms of, of dollars and cents, which we, you know, we're, we're trying to make universal so that everybody understands. Right now, we spend 10% of our uh, property tax revenues come for the purpose of paying off school bonds. And so, as I mentioned earlier, in 2025 and 2026, we'll pay off all of our debt, and that 10% of the tax bill will disappear in those two years, those two levy years, um, should this referendum not pass. What we're proposing is that we carry that forward to do the work that we believe needs to be done in the most efficient way possible in terms of not throwing good money after bad. Um, people move to town because of these schools. I mean, literally, everybody I talk to say, I moved to Batavia because of its schools. And if the reputation of this town changes, uh, and then you know, the dynamics of our home values changes. Um, I believe this community is a unique place. It's one place I enjoy, and you know, moving here as a young kid, and um, it, it, it's special, and it's built around its schools, and um, its identity really revolves around its schools, and it's, it's something that we want to carry forward, not just from a property tax standpoint, but from a pride standpoint, what we offer our children. Tony, if I could do a follow-up to your answer on that question. We have another question that I think ties in. If the referendum passes, what is the time frame for the resulting bonds until they are retired? The time frame is that when bonds, or when authority, when the community, when voters give permission to issue bonds, um, the, the taxing body has that permission for five years. And so the amount of money up to the, to, to the limit could be issued um, for five years. We don't issue that money all at once um, it, well, because of arbitrage rules like IRS, they won't let you. Actually, it would be a really good time to issue a bunch of bonds and then put the money in a bank because you could make more than it would cost. And obviously, the IRS does not like that. And so you have to use that money within a certain time frame, 18 months. Uh, and so we would have to issue them in batches as, as the construction projects came online and were completed and the bills had to be paid. Okay, Juliana or Sylvia, do you have anything to add? Want to have input into this aspect of the tie between the referendum passage, property values, and property taxes? I do. Um, so I'm here looking at the taxes from that quintessential $350,000 house, and we had a referendum passed in 2007, and I watched the, the value of the house peaked in 2008, and then it dropped steadily to 2014 when it hit rock bottom. 
and then started climbing again. So that referendum for $75 million great, gave us the big, the BFAC, the field house, all the amenities that the Ellis Gustafson and everything, and it did not affect, it did not increase property values. In fact, property values decreased after that. And Tony had said that um, people moved to Batavia for the schools. I'm going to borrow from the mayor who says people move to Batavia for the schools, but people leave Batavia because of the schools, because the taxes are just too high. Juliana? We have a responsibility to maintain the schools that we have, the pride that our community has in the schools and the quality of our schools. Um, my my thought is more so the danger of our property values if this referendum doesn't pass, if anything does happen to our schools and the risk that we face therein. <coughs> okay, this will be the last question of the evening. Thank you, audience, by the way. Um, it's been a pleasure to be here. Who is supporting your position? This is obviously for the four the organizations representing the four uh, position and the against position. Who is supporting your position on this issue and how are they supporting you? Juliana, would you like to go first? Who is supporting your position on this issue and how are they supporting you? I believe they're getting at your organization. Who, um, what is, who mm -hmm. makes up your organization and where do you receive any backing and support from? <coughs> sure, we receive support from the community members. Um, we're registered in the state if you have further questions on, on that. And Sylvia? Um, Who's responsible government is funded by individuals for, we spent $408 on the yard site, and Juliana's group is, and she's not being completely honest, because most of their funding comes from the organizations, the businesses, that are contracted with, with the school district. DLR group and Lamp Incorporated, specifically, between the two, between November and now, they've given $20,000 to the Vote Yes campaign. And that can be all found at the Illinois Board of Elections on their website. <coughs> I'm going to, in all fairness, um, I'm not Julianne, would you care to comment back on that? No, there's nothing factual. Like I said, we're registered with the State Board of Elections. We're in communication with them, and all of our filings are publicly available. Okay. We do receive support from community members. We have to receive support from, from community members. All that information available. All right, thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Patty. Thanks, Shannon. Thank you all for sitting through this. Um, I've been asked to ask the members of the various groups if they would stick around for a few minutes and talk to individuals. Um, and so I said, yes, you would. <laughs> um, thanks to BATV, they are our, our wonderful group. They're, they follow us everywhere, and we should figure out a way to pay them because they don't get paid for what they do enough. For more information, please visit the nonpartisan website, the IllinoisVoterGuide.org, where the recording of this forum will be posted, as well as the League of Women Voters of Central Kane County website and our Facebook pages. Please remember to vote on or before April 4th, and let's thank the participants tonight. And thank you, audience, for sitting through this. Um, we appreciate it. The League of Women Voters is, a not, as I said, is nonpartisan, and we hold forums like this all the time. If you are interested in seeing the forums for the Batavia School District, please check our website because we those were the first ones we did in February. So take a look at them. So thank you very much. Have a good evening.